In 2011, Mark Anderson famously said that software was eating the world. Now APIs are eating the software. They are changing the way software is built and enabling a new age of applications. We are going to learn today how APIs are reshaping software from Nicolas Design, co-founder and CEO of Algolia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. Okay, so I'm Nicolas, co-founder and CEO of Algolia, and today, yes, I'm going to speak about how APIs are completely changing the way we build software. But first, maybe a bit of context about Algolia. So, of course, we do an API, a search API, and that's why I like to speak about this topic. We provide an instant search as a service. We help websites and mobile apps to deliver a, an instant search experience to their users. So let me show you what I mean by instant. So here is the website of Jadopado, one of our customers, an e-commerce website in Dubai. Because we send results in only a few milliseconds, they've been able to deliver a true search as you type experience, updating the full result page after each keystroke. So basically, we offer a search API to enable every developer to deliver search an experience in their own website and apps. It turns out that this speed, this instant access to content, actually dramatically improves users' engagement. Jadopado doubled that conversion. It's true for e-commerce, for mobile apps, and probably for most of the services you use every day. Actually, you probably already used us, uh, for example, in Product Hunt, Hacker News, or Crunchbase. We launched the service about a year ago and have been growing at a crazy pace since then, about 30% month over month growth in revenue. We today have more than 350 customers in more than 40 countries. And in October alone, we served more than 1 billion user-generated queries from 12 data centers. Okay, so that was us. Now let's go more deeply about what is an API first. An API is a set of requirements. Well, let's just say that an API is the glue that will connect applications together. And I will be even more specific because I will be concentrating on only web APIs. Basically, providing a gateway for software to access web based services. Actually, these web APIs are not new. Already in 2011, that was three years ago, you had many what I call billionaires. That means APIs that were having, receiving more than one billion calls every single day. You got Twitter, Facebook, Google, Netflix, well, the usual suspects. But you know what's even better than billion? Trillions. Here it's S3, Amazon S3 the storage service from Amazon. In April 2013, that is 18 months ago, they already had two trillion objects stored and serving more than one million requests per second. That trillions requests per day. And here it's a bit different from what I was showing before with Twitter, Facebook, Google, and the, uh, the others, because they, these ones they were providing an API to access their platform, their ecosystem. Amazon, the API is the product. And that's a trend we are seeing a lot more today. You probably already heard about Twilio, which is providing a communication API. Parse, a uh, backend uh, for mobile applications. Stripe for payment. Majet or Sandwich for emails. So today, if you, you want to accept payment, you can simply plug to Stripe in a few hours. Uh, sending SMS, you can use Twilio. You don't need to reinvent the wheel anymore. That enables you to deliver your software, to develop it much, much faster. Um, and, uh, well, Mark Anderson indeed famously said that software is eating the world. So today what we're saying is that APIs, in turn, are eating software. The first one to say that was actually Steve Wilmot from Swisscale. Any new software should use APIs simply to shorten the time to market and to get a better uh, features. So 
for the API provider, that really changed the way uh, you would market. You don't market to consumer. You don't market. You don't actually market to businesses either. You are really targeting developers, and in itself, it's a big challenge. But before to, to dive into the challenges of API providers, let me go through a few reasons to use APIs first. So first reason, time into market. Of course, you want to deliver your product fast. You don't want to spend months to develop a new feature before to be able to, to simply to test it and to see if there is some traction. APIs gives you instant access to complex infrastructure. Let me give you one example. Probably you know about Yo, this communication social app. It was actually built in eight hours, not eight months, just eight hours. So the guys could validate the application directly. And in just three months, they've been able to, be, uh, to achieve more than one billion, um, sorry, one million downloads. Eight hours. I mean, prefer to validate my application after one day of work instead of months. Second reason, access to data and ecosystems. We are going back to Twitters and the Facebooks of the world, of the world here. If you want to uh, get people signing up to your uh, service, why not simply to use this, uh, this platform, this ecosystem already existing? Much better user experience to do just a click to sign up instead of going to us through, to, uh, through a very long process. And what's even better, for you, you can get access to their whole network, their friends, their data, and enrich your product directly, day one. Um, access to data is also enabling new kind of applications. So here I'm using the example of Mansion. Mansion is a, a monitoring hub where you can simply monitor your brand, or your competitors, or actually any keywords. And every time there is a mention on the internet, you'll get a notification. To get that real-time notification, they actually are using uh, APIs. APIs from Twitter, from Facebook, Flickr, YouTube, many others. And they are simply doing a kind of mashup of all this data. Speaking about data, you also have this open data trend, clearly unlocking new initiatives. So I won't spend too much time on that, but simply two examples. OpenStreetMap, already used by big players like Foursquares. It's, we are speaking about crowdsourcing. It's a crowdsourcing data. Uh, OpenGov, OpenGov using APIs on top of open data are helping uh, cities to engage their citizens to participate in the, the community because they are opening all their data. And to conclude on this ecosystem uh, uh, reason to, to really use APIs, let me just tell you a few words about platforms like Facebook, but also Salesforce. These platforms are becoming big enough that you can actually build businesses on top of it. Aptas is an example. They developed a thriving business simply 100% on top of Salesforce APIs. They raised last year more than 30 million with this product. Third reason, reliability. I don't know for you, but I mean, when you are building a software and you want to add features, uh, you have so many things to do. Probably what you are going to build won't be as reliable as what would build a company whose sole purpose is to provide an API. I mean, APIs for these companies are the lifeblood of their company. If they are down, they don't earn any money. Worse, their customers will leave. Example with Chartboost. Chartboost is an advertising company. They provide, well, they display ads. If their API is done, they don't display any ads. I mean, they don't have any revenue. It's as simple as that. And scaling. Uh, I hope for you that uh, your applications will get a lot of success. When it scales, everything starts to break. Better again to just simply trust a provider who has already tons of customers using their API, who are already able to handle that kind of scale. First reason, richness. Uh, API gives you access to um, a swarm of functionalities that you could dev couldn't even dream of, uh, enabling you to innovate um, at a much faster pace. Again, a simple example. 
Stripe. With Stripe, you can start to accept payments in every country in a few hours. And you can believe me, we use Stripe. I mean, in less than a day, we've been able to go from zero to accepting payments everywhere. Today, we have, 40, uh, we are, have customers in 40 countries, in part uh, thanks to Stripe. And there are also a good proof about the economy of API. Stripe today is a billion dollar company. I mean, just with an API targeting developers. Five, ubiquity. I mean, you just need an internet access. You don't need to care about your operating system, about anything. You just need an internet access, and you can connect to as many APIs as you want. So for some features, actually, uh, the response time is important, like search for WhatsApp, or uh, when you want to get your users to interact together. When this response time is important, you need to be present in several uh, continents. You need to have servers everywhere. And believe me, that's very difficult to set up. Again, better to trust providers that have done that for many other customers. OK, and the nice thing about that is that when you use these external services to build your software, of course, you free up a lot of time. And this time, you can simply use it to concentrate on your own product, on, what's, on where is the true value of what you are building. Let me continue with uh, the challenges. Uh, like APIs as product is a nice concept, but of course it comes with its own challenges. First one, reliability. Reliability is, the is one of the best reasons to choose an external provider, an API, but at the same time it's a big challenge for the API provider. Because, as I said, it's the lifeblood of your company. You cannot simply accept to be done. Uh, you want to be 100% uh, available at any time. So that means that for, from day one, you need to take into account hardware failures. Because hardware fail, you need to have redundancy. You, you need to tolerate faults. Uh, worse, you don't have the time to do any maintenance. Because if you do maintenance, you go down. So you need to be able to update your software, your API, on the fly without uh, breaking anything. Uh, <coughs> and of course, you never want to break production code of your customers. And that's a challenge, believe me. But better do it uh, once for one API that, than doing it for every single feature of your product. Second challenge, geo-distribution. Again, that's a very nice aspect of APIs, available everywhere. But, of course, it comes with some challenges. Languages. Maybe your customer is, is in Japan and doesn't want to speak English. Uh, we are kind of lucky here because uh, developers usually code in English. So that's nice. But when they want to get support, when they want to have somebody helping them, in some culture, it becomes very difficult uh, to be able to communicate with them. Uh, and the best thing you can do is to communicate in their own language. Well, we don't speak Japanese yet, but uh, we are working on that. Time zones. Uh, of course, you may not want to do some support at 3 AM. So you need to distribute your team. So at the beginning, it's not possible because it's difficult to have people everywhere. Uh, you end up, um, I mean, sleeping late, not sleeping a lot, or rotating to be able to support your customers at any time. It's a challenge. And uh, the last one about geo distribution, latency. Okay, depends on the API. Sometimes latency is not important, like the response time is not so important. For us, in particular, because we are focusing on instant search, we want the response, the, the answer, the, the results of every query to be instantly uh, delivered to the end users. And to do that, we need to be close to them because that couldn't work otherwise. Uh, let me show you what that I mean by that. So what we propose to our customers is automatically to replicate their data in many uh, locations. Once that is done, wherever their users are, they will simply access the closest data center. And 
experimenting instant search experience. Again, doing that yourself is very difficult. Go to market. We are targeting developers, uh, maybe product owners, and these kind of people are not your traditional targets. Uh, let me give you an example. Here are some data from a few publications. Back in January, we did an article in TechCrunch about our product. TechCrunch has a huge readership, and we got so many shares, social shares, it was really impressive. Only 1,000 visitors, not much. A few months later, we did a single guest post on Intercom. So Intercom has a very nice blog, but well, compared to TechCrunch, it's a very sm much smaller readership. Double the number of visitors. Because they were typically our target. They were caring about what we were explaining. Even better, Hacker News. Uh, a simple tech post about uh, JSONP. I mean, tech stuff. 7,000 unique visitors. Hacker News, of course, is our typical uh, target community using us. And uh, about go to market, let me tell you the exact thing that worked best, the, the, the best hack we ever did in terms of marketing. It was to help these communities. It was to uh, um, implement, to help them with search. Search is our expertise. So let's use it and see what we can do for these communities. So we simply propose them to power their search for free. So we did the search for Hacker News for product and for growthhackers.com. It break, ah, thanks to that, we got a lot of awareness in these communities, generating a lot of leads, exactly what we wanted to do. But more than visitors and leads, what it enabled us to do it was to create, to change these community leaders into evangelists. These people are speaking about us to all people, everybody in their communities when they have a search problem. So we did many other things, but that was probably our better hack. Yeah. Sorry. So first challenge, developer experience. Uh, I was speaking about search experience for the end users. When you are providing an API, you are targeting developers. So you need also to care about their own experience by when using your product. Documentation is usually the one thing that people don't care much about. Sorry. Uh, but documentation is actually 50% of your product when you are building an API, I mean. It's also your marketing. Uh, you couldn't believe the number of times people came back to us saying that uh, they chose us because of our documentation. Because before to subscribe, they were able to understand what the product was doing, and they, was, was, they were able to see how they would integrate it in a very short time. <coughs> and because you are um, speaking to developers, you need to take care about their culture. Developers they like to self-serve. They want to be able, sorry, they want to be able to uh, use the product without having to speak to anybody. So, of course, your product must be usable in that way. But at the same time, of course, they can need support. Then, support must be done by developers too. You cannot just externalize support to people who don't know to code, because the problems we get are code coding problems. Okay, perfect. Last challenge. Uh, going back to that. Looks like very delay. Okay. So, shit happens. So, uh, well, you know that uh, your product uh, always can have failures. And trust is the biggest challenge you will have. Because you need, uh, especially in the beginning, I mean, you need trust to get customers. And to get trust, you need customers. So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. In our case, in the beginning, we haven't had uh, rough, some first customers coming to ask us, OK, what happens if your company fails? What happens with my product? I'm trusting you with a core feature of my product. 
honestly, there is no correct answer. You just try to get new customers and new customers, and in the end, it simply get better. But even when you start to gain this trust, of course, shit happens. Uh, and then, when it happens, everything is about the way you will handle it. Let me give you one example. We got a customer, an uh, enterprise customer, so paying a lot of money, and we introduced a bug, we failed him, and um, they got a downtime of search of maybe 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, the second it appeared, it happened, the second we realized there was a problem, everybody was there to help and to try to do whatever possible to help these customers to get up to speed and get this search, its search working again. It was not in our terms, I mean, uh, of course we got an SLA, okay, we should have given them like a small token or something. We reimbursed the whole month. That was several thousand of dollars for them and for us. Uh, that customer was uh, in the end so happy that he wrote a blog post about it. A blog post about the service experience he had with us. Uh, explaining how uh, the service, I mean, he explained like in SaaS, uh, software as a service, there is this last ace service, and how it, the experience was kind of magical. Uh, that's a lifetime customer for us now, just because we were able to handle that uh, that problem with him. Well, don't make shit, don't make failures on purpose just to have the occasion to interact. Not a good idea. Sorry, <laughs> reaching my last slide. Maybe at the end of the presentation it takes more time. Um, just a couple of takeaways uh, to conclude. When you build an API, that's the most important are your customers. So do take care about them. Make sure they are successful. Go the extra step. Be proactive. If they, you see they are using the API in a bad way, simply call them and give them best practice. Make sure they are successful. Because that's also the people that will recommend you next. And when you build any other software, Please concentrate on your own product. Don't lose time implementing, uh, yet again, a new payment system, a new communication system, mailing system, or uh, search system. Just use the best of breed out there. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolas. Do you guys have questions? You have to, you're technical, a lot of you. I am sorry, have a it's, question it's a here? Bit technical presentation. <laughs> That's good. They love tech. Thank you. Hi, I'm Octavian, a developer of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> first question, um, the search really works as fast as uh, I saw in the presentation when you start typing the yeah, problem. Yeah, that was, you can go to the website, jado.pado.com. Uh, this one is, uh, is actually not using uh, our uh, distributed search network but it's using our uh, European data center. So from here, it should be as fast as it was yeah. there. That's it's, it's actually a screen cut. And uh, second question, when you showed the map with the data centers, I saw two in Central Europe. Yeah. Is, there, is there a reason? Uh, there is one in uh, east of France, and the other is in Germany. Uh, there is no uh, necessity for uh, latency. Here it's more like, especially for Germans, they like to have their data in their own country. So it's more a business reason than a latency reason, these ones. Um, but uh, out of that, I mean, you just, I mean, it doesn't make sense to choose one of them and to use a replicate, to replicate in the user. Uh, you would choose either one of them depending of where you are from. And there is, well, there is like maybe 25 to 30 milliseconds latency between them. So if your users are mostly Eastern Europe, better choose the German one. If it's like uh, UK, um, down to Portugal, you better use the French one. Thank you. Any other questions? Come on, techies. Okay, I have a question. Good. How interesting is the Romanian market for you? And <laughs> why? Uh, I should have checked before if we have customers here. <laughs> uh, probably one or two. Uh, how is interesting? Uh, so for us, I would uh, answer more globally than typically the Romanian market, but I would say how is interesting it is to go outside of US and maybe of Western Europe. Uh, the, the nice thing about building an API as we did is that it's available everywhere. 
but because of this latency problem, and the fact that we have data centers that are close to these regions, uh, enable us to access to market with a much smaller competition. Uh, okay, of course, US are, are still our biggest market by far, but say we have customers in Dubai, like Jadopado I showed, we have about 10 customers in uh, Australia. I mean, if we didn't have any data center in Asia, we wouldn't have these customers. So the, having customers in Romania is great. I mean, I would, uh, this number uh, of 40 countries is actually something, uh, well, it's a vanity metric, but it's something I really like uh, to see growing because it means it's really spreading everywhere. And uh, we are kind of trying to become like, uh, really change the way people implement search, uh, getting rid of the search button everywhere. So it's not like we don't want to concentrate on US services, but everywhere. Bring down Google. <laughs> no, well, Google is not exactly, well, I'm not doing a web search, so it's I not know, exactly uh, the same. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.